Great. Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce our next speaker. Uh, John Brazel uh, has an MSc and a PhD. He is retired. He's now an independent researcher, but he was previously a clinical biochemist, uh, a medical science researcher, a medical laboratory scientist, a laboratory information systems manager, and a public health information systems manager. So he comes from a very impressive scientific background. And John is also one of the administrators on the L CTS double four double six YDNA project, and uh, he's going to talk to us about that today, and also a particular branch of that project, which he describes as a tumbleweed branch of the YDNA tree. So, can you please give a warm welcome for John Brazel? Thank you very much, Morris. Thank you all for coming here this afternoon, and not just to listen to me. <laughs> Uh, can, can you remember, or how many of you know what the tumbleweed is? All right, so some of you do. There was doubts expressed that maybe younger people might not know. So what you need to keep in your in your mind is the sound of a spaghetti western movie or a raikoon or crack against the background here. Why did, why did I use the, uh, the image of a tumbleweed? Well, it's a plant that breaks off from its stem and it disperses its seed as it's blown by the wind. And it's a really good example for this particular branch of the Y-DNA tree that I'm going to describe, because it, this is a branch that's found itself at frontiers, particularly in the American Southwest, and it's an invader from Eurasia like the R1Bs. The outline of the presentation, hold on a second. I forgot to, turn, I forgot to advance the slides, apologies. Uh, okay, so the, the, the presentation is organized into these different sections. I'm going to just briefly talk about DNA and tests for different aspects of genealogy, then talk about uh, why chromosome evolution and survival, the technologies and analysis associated with them, and then get into why, the Y chromosome tree and the branches, and more specifically the branches that I'm uh, talking about are the CTS4466 branch, and the sub-branch of that, which is known as RA151. And I'm going to be talking about surnames of the most distant known ancestor and the locations that they were associated with. So those are not live people now, so I hope there's no data protection issues associated with those. I'm going to talk about some of the challenges and tools that can be used to investigate these uh, names and locations and the relationships between them. And then I have a number of questions that I'm hoping to answer over the next few years. And then, of course, last but not least, the credits for some of my uh, co-workers in this particular area. OK, DNA, this is, a, I suppose this is just a, a very brief catch-up. We're talking about the code of life made up of paired strands of nucleotides and bases, four different bases, adenosine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. And they pair up complementary in on opposite sides, on the opposite strands, adenine pairs with thymine, and cytosine pairs with guanine. And these sequences are uh, inform our, our characteristics. Okay, I'm going to be talking about Y chromosome DNA and Y chromosome DNA tests today. Clearly, there have been other talks over the past few days on different aspects of uh, DNA, of mitochondrial DNA where people are investigating their maternal heritage and maternal matches, and autosomal DNA, where people are looking at the autosomes. Okay, so as I say, I, I'll be talking about Y chromosome DNA, I won't be talking about mitochondrial DNA, and I won't be talking about, well, I won't be talking very much about autosomal DNA, which is the analysis of the 22 non-sex chromosomes. I will mention that just briefly at one point, but that's just in terms of making connections. Uh, the Y chromosome is passed on from fathers to their sons, largely unchanged down through the generation. Some changes do occur, and these changes are, can be used to trace paternal ancestry. One of the things I think that we've got to remember when we're doing all of this 
is that all the individuals that are identified in this study and all the other Y chromosome tests that we're talking about on living people, as opposed to ancient DNA, these are the latest representatives of Y chromosome lineages that have mutated and su survived up to the present time. During the presentation yesterday about the O'Neill project, Y chromosome project, they were talking about not having changes identified over thousands of years. That presumably meant that the changes were occurring, but all of those side branch Y changes, those people didn't survive up until the present day. Those, those branches have died out. And there's many reasons why branches can die out. Not first that is obviously war, because our history is full of people fighting and killing each other. Equally, you know, the Great Famine in the 1845 wasn't the first famine, won't be the last famine. Starvation has regularly affected people on this island down the millennia. Fever is, an, is another one, you know, obviously in 1918 we had the Spanish flu back in previous times there were various other epidemics and what have you which killed people off and uh, resulted in Y lines being lost. Uh, an interesting study recently by David Reich on an investigation in Spain showed that all the all the Y chromosomes there that were associated with the Neolithic period disappeared. Now, they, many of them may have been killed or starved, but they certainly didn't have the option to continue their Y chromosome line because the new, the new guys, you know, got all the attention from the girls. And the other one is, as well, that we've seen in some, of, some families is that uh, families daughter out, you know, there are no sons. That's the end of that, that particular branch of a Y chromosome line. So, we've been talking all through these past few days about uh, DNA analysis and evolving technologies, uh, increasingly powerful and reducing costs. Initial technologies focused on these things called short tandem repeats, which are uh, abbreviated to STRs. And there are regions of DNA that are made up of multiple copies of short repeating sequences, saved as TATT, four, four uh, nucleotide bases there. And they, they can repeat a variable number of times depending on the individual. So you can have, uh, say, a particular uh, short tandem repeat sequence where you might have, for example, 12 copies in a, a given individual. But this can mutate then, it could go to 13, it could go to 11. It can actually back mutate as well and go back to 12. So, so there are people who are very good at analyzing these STR changes and can identify from, from these tests, from 37 STR markers more, uh, more powerfully with 67 or 111 STR markers, they can determine what particular branch of the haplotype tree you, you sit in, in the big Y tree. And like, and in fact, it was one of these STR uh, tests that enabled uh, uh, Nigel McCarthy of the CTS 4466 plus uh, project to identify that my Y chromosome uh, originally was a member of the CTS 4466 group. <coughs> Whoops. We'll just press it again. Oh. There you go. There we go. That's the... Uh... I'm looking for two. It's, oh, it's, that's the wrong one. Yeah. Apologies. There you go. Okay. <laughs> Apologies. Technology, how are you? <laughs> Technology advances and people don't always. <laughs> okay. So as I say, the advances in technology have continued and reduced costs now allow the identification of, of single nu uh, DNA nucleotides, those single bases. And the single change in those is known as a single nucleotide polymorphism. Now, if you know what the, a candidate SNP, uh, which one you're actually aiming at, you can find out whether or not an individual is positive or negative for that particular SNP for as little as 16, 16 euro. But clearly, you know, a negative result isn't going to tell you where they are, but if it's a positive result, you, you've, got, you, you, you've got that person fairly firmly in your, uh, y, in your y, uh, DNA tree. The discovery of new SNPs that allow the identifi identification of new branches requires more uh, complete analysis of DNA 
and that is still sort of relatively expensive. I know at the FT DNA stand at the moment you can get a discount on, on the, the big Y test at this particular meet, and then there are periodic uh, sales as well, but it's sort of over 500 euro, it's, you, you really want to have a pretty good reason for, 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 for going for it. Okay, this is Mike Walsh's uh, R1B L21 descendant tree, and I'm not going to go through all the branches of it. The arrow at the bottom there is, uh, points out this CTS4466 branch that I'm going to be talking about from here on in, in, the, in, the, in the presentation. So just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, and as was has been said several times during presentations or over the past few days, the times on all of these uh, changes, there's a degree of wobble associated with them. So we're talking about the L21 uh, SNP mutation occurring four and a half thousand years ago. Uh, DF13 is downstream of that, it's just shortly afterwards. And then if you come down then to the CTS4466, mutation, you'll find that that is uh, a, 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 occurred in and around 200 BC. So just to set the sort of the, uh, the uh, environment that uh, you find th these particular changes, you're talking about going from the Irish Bronze Age, two and a half thousand uh, BC, to the end of the Iron Age, Irish Iron Age at 400, 500 AD. Okay, so this CTS4466 was initially identified in 2006 from short tandem repeat testing. It's the defining, uh, it's associated with the, uh, the south of Ireland, the province of Munster. There is a particular SNP mutation now, the CTS4466, that was identified in 2012, which is uh, associated or it, you know, is uh, yeah, associated with the Irish modal type 2. So as I say, associated with the south of Ireland and the province of Munster. Uh, actually, I'll just go back for a second there and just say that CTS4466, there's been some speculation as to where this mutation may have occurred, whether it did actually occur in the south of Ireland or whether it occurred in southwest Britain or in Wales. So if we're talking about sub-branches of uh, CTS4466, you've got the, uh, the A451, A4, A551, A4, A5, A5, branch, which represents 46% of the participants. And then of that particular branch, you have S1121, which represents 55% of the A541 branch. Uh, this is split then into a number of different groups. The L270 group is associated with the O'Sullivans. Uh, there's the Z1625-1 group and sub-branches of that that are associated with O'Donoghue's, Moriarty's and O'Mahony's. And then you have the, a, a variety of names below that, O'Keefe, Sheen, Dennehy, other Sullivans, Toomey, Quirk, Dunnegan and Kelleher. And what you've got across all of these branches are McCarthy's turning up in, in all the various plants. And, and don't ask me to explain that. So it's, uh, Elizabeth O'Donoghue here or Ross or Nigel McCarthy might explain that better than I could. I'm going to be concentrating on uh, the A. 151 branch now. As I said, the, the A541 branch represents the bulk of the CTS4466. Uh, you've got the Donovan Regan branch, the Z21065, that represents 35% of A541. And so A151 represents much of the remainder. You're talking about the, the last 10%. So the, the, the definitely a small branch. <coughs> but even though they're a small branch, I think they're a very interesting branch. Uh, we have 43 men who have identified as positive for this mark and have had an FT DNA big Y test, which have identified uh, further downstream SNPs from RA151. When 
when this particular mutation occurred, you're talking perhaps 2000, uh, 200 AD, but it's also their uh, estimate for the, for the upstream mutations as well. So sometime in the, the first half of the, uh, the first millennium would seem to be a reasonable estimate. It will be great when more people get tested and there's more analysis of this that we can tighten these dates because if we can tighten these dates, then we can work out what the more, what the more likely historical scenarios are associated with the dispersal dislocation of, of populations. So if we look at how this, this, uh, <clears throat> this branches, we can see that we have the the uh, A151 br branch here coming down from CTS uh, 4466 and uh, A541 comes, comes down to A151 and then you can see that this branches into a series of uh, defining SNPs there and if you look at the different branch, you can see that there are roughly five, five different branches or segments hold on a second that try and do this so we've got this branch this arm here one two three four five no six there's one guy in the sixth column over there well one of the things to note about this particular uh, branch of the ydna tree is it it obviously occurred long before the evolution or the adoption of hereditary surnames and like but one of the things to note is that the the variety in the names of the most distant known ancestor and the like. So you will see here that there are names that are, uh, might be Welsh or Scottish, nor, uh, Scandinavian, English, Irish, Scottish again perhaps, and, and a McCarthy. <laughs> McCarthy's turn up everywhere. <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, the other, this, this particular branch here now are, uh, are noticeable because there are a lot of uh, kitten men with this particular surname or variations, slight variations in the spelling of it, but they're all on, on this particular arm here. There are Macaulays from different parts of the, the world who are, exist, are, are in totally different parts of the tree. These are Macaulays from the, uh, the islands of Lewis and Harris uh, from the northwest of Scotland, from the Outer Hebrides. This particular branch here is uh, com comes down here and comes down uh, through a SNP called A714 and then you can see that that splits into uh, a 715 positive branch. There's a number of individuals identified here but you'll see the names here are uh, Shinnick, Fox, Thrasher, Davidson and Brazel and pro probably Hill as well. We have two individuals called Hill at the moment who are testing Big Y and are almost certainly on this arm somewhere. The question is, are they 715 positive or, or not? And to lie. But uh, this is an, inter an interesting point, just a side point really, that uh, it shows the evolution of uh, hereditary surnames. For, for those of you who uh, speak Irish, you'll know that Shinnick is from the Irish for Fox. So this name has been anglicized directly from the Irish whereas Fox has been translated from the Irish. And the, whoops, sorry, press the wrong button again. So, so that's there. And the, the other one here is, this is another case of a, a name change. And this was a, a story that was told to me by, by uh, the late Rick Davidson, was that he had a, a block in his genealogy and he couldn't get back beyond the middle 1800s. And like, and then he found out through genetic genealogy that genetically he was a thrasher, which is a, an English occupational name. And doing further research, he discovered that uh, he had a, an ancestor who changed his name during the American Civil War. And Rick said that that was uh, his own witness protection program. He'd obviously done something that he didn't want to be accountable for. Uh, this particular branch here, Simmons and Ritchie, perhaps those are surnames that are uh, Scottish-ish, maybe, it's hard to know. And, like, and then we have a branch over here, which is very clearly associated with Ireland to this day, and to the southwest of Ireland particularly. 
And then we have this guy over on the far side, again, a Scandinavian name. Whoops, sorry, apologies. So, so you can see that we have a whole range of, of names from across uh, Britain and Ireland and over into Scandinavia. And I suppose one of the questions is, uh, can we identify uh, the, the historical circumstances that might have caused that particular distribution. So, what I have here is I have mapped the, the, most, uh, the, the locations of the most distant known ancestors here in Ireland, and the, the colours on the arrows are really just those that are either A151 and I've not gone down the particular branches, or those that are 714 positive, 715 negative, and then the late, later branch here, 714 positive, 715 positive. So, so these, are, these are later SNP mutations. And you'll see that the, we have individuals here, the 151s. They're all from associated with the south of Ireland, except for this guy up here, up here, who is is in the north. But we'll come back to him, and you'll potentially see where he's, he's coming from. But you have them, they're associated with Munster and South Leinster. So you can see there's two blue dots there, two yellow dots there, uh, two yellow dots there, and then the, the, the red dots there. So this sort of follows on from the fact that the CTS 4466 is associated with the, the south of Ireland, albeit some of them have wandered over into uh, South Leinster. Okay, if we look then at, uh, as I was saying, the Macaulay's, they have found themselves up on Lewis and Skye and on the, 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 the other islands there and on the, the, the mainland of northwest Scotland. You have our friend here in the north of Ireland in Antrim. These are the locations of their most distant known ancestors and actually the times associated with them. So the, many of them are in the 1600s or beforehand. And we have this guy here in Cumbria. But if we look then beyond uh, and go further north, we can see this sort of northeasterly drift uh, going along. So we have uh, somebody with their most distant known ancestor in Denmark, and then three guys with their most distant known ancestor in Norway. And I suppose one of the things that we're wondering about is, uh, you know, what circumstances might have. Uh, uh, encourage these guys to sort of follow the route that they've taken. And I suppose the, the, the one that occurs uh, to most people most quickly is obviously these are a South of Ireland uh, Y-DNA haplotype and they've gone up to the northwest of Scotland and potentially on to Scandinavia, so you think Vikings. But again, it comes down to when this mutation occurred. And as we get more information, they could potentially have been, particularly the, the guys in the northwest of Scotland, they could have gone there as uh, slaves, or well, they could have gone as slaves, but they could have gone as saints or scholars or whatever, you know. It depends when, the, when in time we can pinpoint the, these migrations to, because if you're talking about early Christianity, you would have had Irish monks going from Ireland and going... Record, they are recorded as well, like St. Brendan going from the southwest of Ireland up to the, the, the Orkneys and, and obviously ultimately to, uh, to Iceland and beyond, perhaps, and the like. So, so that's a big, big question. You know, what was the, you know, the force that actually brought them up there? So we have a number of individuals now that we have tested in North America, and I'm concentrating primarily here on the, the, the downstream branch, the 714 positive branch, 715 positive branch. So we have them here on the east coast of the US and going over towards the, the Midwest. And this is an interesting story. This is a, a guy in Australia, and he is trying to identify uh, his biological antecedents, well, his great-great-great-grandmother was in uh, what's called a, a factory, it would have been a workhouse, the Paramatta factory in New South Wales. And she, she escaped 
from the factory uh, and she was recovered and brought back but she had got pregnant in the meantime and this guy is trying to identify who his uh, biological uh, ancestor might be because the child was taken away from, from the girl and was forcibly adopted. So he's trying to look at transportation records now and look at some of the names that right, have been identified associated with this haplotype to see if he can find them on a, on a ship list or a transportation list so far. And he hasn't been able to do so so far. Okay, so we mentioned that hereditary surnames were adopted in Ireland from about 1000 AD forward. They were definitely, they were adopted significantly later in Scandinavia. Uh, there have been social and cultural dis uh, disruption in Ireland during the 16th and 17th centuries and a lot earlier. And this may have contributed to, to some of the, the changed surnames. And this, I think, is something that I'm just wondering about, about some of the people who have gone to America from, from Ireland. Religious and cultural pressures in North American colonies uh, may have resulted in changes in religion and in surnames as well as a loss of awareness or suppression of Irish origins. Uh, we've discussed some of these issues already today. Privacy concerns, obviously, and data protection. But again, this is making some of the, the work that I've been trying to do in so identifying surnames or haplotypes and the like. It, it, it can be a, a little bit of a difficulty. It's also a concern to a greater or lesser degree in would-be recruitees as to whether or not, you know, the extent to which their information is going to be protected or shared. There's obviously, again, the big one as well is the fear of un unanticipated results. You know, the, this is true for any genealogy, but it can be a surprise, you know, if a genetic result comes back very different from what people might have expected. There's the cost or the perceived cost. And I think we've all, all also talked about it's, it's definitely a challenge to getting people to sign up is their lack of scientific or genealogical knowledge to interpret the results that you get. So you do actually have to, to bring people through on that. And some people are more open to it than others. Okay, so it's, in terms of the tools to use, I think we've talked about some of them already at the earlier talk. Family history is the critical one. You, you start off with genealogy, talk to your oldest uh, relations, talk to, there's always going to be a, a genealogy note somewhere in the family. Talk to them, get as much information as you can as possible. Uh, the STR uh, panel testing is still, is still useful, but it has been supplanted to a certain degree by the SNP panel testing which is where you can get a, a whole set of SNPs which can actually identify where in the, uh, in the Y chromosome tree, tree you, you actually uh, uh, sit and the like. And if you've got a very good uh, reason to suspect that the testee is, uh, you know, is likely to be positive for a single SNP test, either a, share, a shared uh, surname or family history that indicates you can get a, a, a positive result for, as I said, as little as 16 euro. Uh, if you want to identify new markers or to be able to uh, discover more and more branches, you have to go and spend uh, the, a bit more money and do a big Y. And uh, GEDmatch, we've already talked about, this is where you can actually identify uh, as we're approaching uh, the genealogical time frame, what is happening now is that single point mutations, the, the single nucleotide polymorphisms are uh, coming up to the ge genealogical uh, time scale. And they're coming within the, the range of uh, connections that you can make through autosomal DNA testing. Autosomal DNA testing will take you back five to seven generations. So you're talking 200, 250 years. So we're talking about SNP tests now that can be identified as occurring within that, that, that particular uh, time, time period. And I, I've had an example of that. And we've talked about Y-Search where you could actually look at a, a sort of a, a shared database that, where you could compare results 
from different individuals. One of the problems at the moment, and it's it's alleviated to a certain extent by a number of the companies now that allow you to uh, upload results from one company to another company. But if people have tested with different companies, it can be difficult sometimes to compare results. So I've uh, got ahead of my slides here, so I shall rattle through these ones now, since I've done that. Okay, so these are questions as yet unanswered. Uh, where did the original A151s live? Well, certainly, I think they, they lived in Munster, like their forebears, their A541 forebears. Did they live in the, 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 the west, centre or east of Munster? And what was their relationship to various other kindred groups, their cousins, if you will, recorded in that locale in the, the mid to late first millennium? How did they get on with these Sullivans and O'Donoghue's and McCarthy's? And what caused them then to be dispersed and displaced across Britain and as far as Scandinavia. So, I mean, a lot of the, uh, some, some of the talks that have been presented over the last few days have been the, the main DNA project. And you've been talking about people who have been dispersed from Ireland, it's, you know, since, since the famine, since the middle of 1800s. And like, we're clearly talking about people who were dispersed a, a thousand years before that. And the reasons for that are probably likely to be similar to the same, same reasons. It's war, famine, starvation. Uh, this, this is a particular question. This is, uh, uh, is a map taken from a publication in the uh, Journal of the Cork Historical and Archaeological Society. And it was written by L Lima Bukala. And... Uh, he was identifying a place called Kennel Brassel, and he, uh, talking to uh, various, various people, the, the, there are different opinions on all of this and the like, and I know that uh, I, I'm no expert in the various kindred groups in this par particular part of Ireland or anywhere at this particular time and the like, but one of the things to actually note is that the the Shinnicks are in this one with his most distant known ancestor in a place called Ballycatu, which is uh, near Cloyne. And this is the sort of the barony of Immachilly. And like, and so he's still there. So uh, maybe his, his uh, ancestors managed to hang in down through the, the, the millennia, or at least, you know, over the last 1500 years. And Obukal has said at that particular time that there were no Brussels left in East Cork. And there's one particular point here that might be relevant to, uh, to Morris or the Eglashians, or O'Gleasons possibly, and the like, who may or may not be related to his North Tipperary branch. I don't think so, though. No. Okay. Okay, this is a, another piece of speculation. I've been talking about sort of the individuals in, in the U.S., and I've been trying to work out how they might have got there. This really came from conversations that I had with the, the late Rick Davidson because he had identified, he lived in, at that, he lived in North Carolina, but he had traced his most distant known ancestor to uh, a place called Gwinnett County, which is near Atlanta in Georgia. And this was actually from uh, a War of Independence uh, pension claim and he was uh, he was uh, wondering how his thrasher ancestor who was born in 1755 had a, a, a Y DNA haplotype that was shared by my ancestors over in North Wexford in Clahaman back in the 1750s and we were wondering about sort of roots as to how this traffic might have happened and one of the interesting things that we've discovered since is that there are uh, 714, 715 positive Brazzles in uh, Newfoundland. And this was uh, Rick's haplotype as well in North Carolina. And we're just wondering because the, this is a little bit of history, the Newfoundland colony and Maryland colonies were founded by uh, Catholic Calverts, uh, 
George Calvert and his son Cecil, who were the Lords, first and second Lords Baltimore. But they lived in Ireland, in, in Clahaman, in North Wexford, where we know <coughs> Brazils were living in the mid 1600s. And so the, the idea is, did, does this actually represent a migration route associated with the, the Calverts as they went from, from Wexford, they, did, they brought people with them from, from Dorset and Devon as well, but they, they initially went to Fairyland. Uh, when Calvert turned up himself there, he realised it was much colder than he'd been told by his agent, and he, he went back to King James I and he said, give me, some, give me a charter for somewhere warmer, please. <laughs> and so he went down to, to Maryland. But then he had a lot of difficulty with the neighbours, sort of, particularly in Pennsylvania. So event, event, eventually the Calverts changed their religion. They managed to hang on to their name. But the fourth Lord Calvert became Protestant to hang on to the colony. So anyway, so that's, that's I'm trying to sort of identify people that I can sort of, uh, will back up this particular, and this is where the, the two Hill individuals are tested, are, are going to be very interesting because Hills were noticeable in the list of settler, initial settlers in the Avalon colony in Fairyland, but also in the initial settlements of Maryland as well. So it'd be very interesting to see where they sit. Uh, the, other, the, the other question I'm trying, going, hoping to ask, answer is whether or not the ancestors to this guy, Jesse Wayne Razzell, now, he did or he didn't kill Pat Garrett. We don't know. He, it, it seems as though he might have been uh, uh, the fall guy in question. But I had said at the beginning of the meeting, the uh, presentation, that I was going to come back to Las Cruces in New Mexico, where the, the original picture of the tumbleways were from. This is, this is where Jesse Wayne Razzle lived. And I'm going to try to answer the question, was he, were his ancestors originally from County Wexford? And this is a, a, an undated picture of the gentleman in question and the like, and his teddy bear. Don't ask me. I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't look like a killer to me. So, my uh, thanks are due to uh, the project administrator of the, the R1B CTS 4466 Plus project, uh, Elizabeth O'Donoghue Ross. My co-admins uh, on this particular project, Nigel McCarthy and James Kane, uh, Jerry O'Connell, Tim Carman, Kathleen Kerwin are, are on the, uh, what's it, it's, a, it's another version, it's another CTS 4466 project. And then we have, obviously, I've taken data from uh, the, the big tree of Alex Williamson and the diagram from Mike Walsh. And one thing I think I would like, particularly like to do is to thank all the individuals who have tested and shared their results. Some of them, since GDPR, have had to be persuaded to reshare their results. Well, I think that what's often overlooked is that, particularly in Y chromosome analysis and the like, it's the, the, the individuals have tested, but they've only tested at the behest of their genealogists, sisters, and female cous cousins. And I'd like to dedicate this presentation to the late Rick Davidson, who was the first A714 identified as recently as in 2014. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. <laughs> Fabulous. Uh, there's a great amount of work that you've done there. And of course, it's in collaboration with a lot of other people who've done the work before you as well. Absolutely. So, and I think this is, this is the way that we are working now as... Um, administrators that deal with haplogroup projects or sub haplogroup projects that uh, and, and it's also reason why it is so important for surname uh, group administrators to actually work very closely with the haplogroup project administrators because they've got a much bigger oversight of the neighbors around your uh, genetic neighbors of your surname so great work there john questions for john about the presentation or any questions in general about uh, SNP analysis, uh, how to build a SNP and STOR based tree. Now we have a question back here. I'll just move down with the microphone. <coughs> Thanks. Is there any um, evidence or have you considered the possibility of a second 
the, the uh, mutation arising in a second place? Uh, these, 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 yeah, the, the, obviously each of these mutations are from one base to a second base, a different base. The thing is that these are the, the, the SNP changes that are at the end of a series of SNP changes. So that, for example, when I'm talking about A715 positive, that particular uh, nuclear change could occur any, any time. But it's also associated with the A151 change, which is associated with the A451. So it's actually a cascade of SNP changes that define, <coughs> that, define your, that particular branch. Okay. Any, any other questions? We have one uh, here from uh, Duane O'Neill. Thanks for the presentation. Um, can you confirm that um, under the CTS 4466 group, is, is that uh, uh, associated with the unpronounceable name? Arjun the Oanakta. Yes. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, hey, I'm glad we got Oanakta, the person. Yes. And then um, in the O'Neill project, we have a subgroup, okay, which is the Rathland uh, uh, set under that. Uh, has that been your experience, or have you come across that in your in your work? Well, I defer here to uh, my project administrators in the back there. The the uh, the O'Sullivans and the Kings of Cashel and the Oanacta, they were obviously the guys who had their their hands on the lever of power. I suspect their A one five one cousins were uh, pushed out to the side somewhat. You know, they weren't close enough to the throne. Elizabeth, would you care to comment on that? Sure. Hello everybody. Um, there's a wide range of times of, as uh, John pointed out, for instance, the McCarthy's are a very particular example of, you find their uh, branches all over the CTS 4466 tree. What that basically means is that they aren't genetically related to the chieftain line of the McCarthy's, which is supposedly only one man at one time. But they chose the name because of the territory they lived in, the affiliations they had, or whatever else. It's almost impossible to know because that goes back so far. With the O'Neills in particular, I have been in touch with uh, Ginger. And uh, there is several different O'Neill sections. Again, there's one section that could perhaps be more easily identified with the Oanak lineage. In the annals, there is supposed to be an O'Neill that is part of the Oanaks. But then there's another O'Neill who is part of the A151 group, which is basically, all they are, though they are all CTS 4466, that O'Neill is almost surely not related in reality to uh, the O'Neills that you're talking about that are more likely to belong to the Oanak lineage. Or at least this is what I surmised from my experience through the CTS 4466, the Munster Irish Project, and that sort of thing. But when you're going back that far, there's basically, it's very difficult to ever know for sure. All we can do is, is survive with probabilities and hope we get it right. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, other questions here from John O'Brien and from Jared Corcoran. John, I'm gonna to come to you first. When you look back at the origins of this um, and the dating that you've been able to do, I noticed that you you know, the father of the one you analyzed, which I guess is uh, all the way back up to CTS 4466, when you go to the European mainland or the, the British Isles in Scotland, is there a dominance of that as the father of that? And can you really say whether 715 was, that SNP was, I think he said 200 AD? Was that a, an Irish uh, uh, or was No, no. It Two, 200 AD might be the, uh, the, the 4466 one. 
715 is much more likely to be it within the historical period. I, as best guess is probably the, the first half of the second millennium. Right. When you go upstream from where you're, where you're finding your grouping, though, where, where are they predominantly found in, um, in Europe? <laughs> That's what I'm trying to find. Lewis, Lewis, Lewis and Harris, I think. Or, well, they are the, the O'Connells in, in southwest Ireland. There are a group of brothels in East Limerick that I am very anxious to recruit a testee from because if they were 714 positive, that would mean that they were, would be a sort of a West Munster group as opposed to the Central and East Munster representatives that I have other than the O'Connells. The O'Connells are, are, are on the West side. And I know from talking to uh, a colleague, uh, Jerry O'Connell there, that he's been investigating different branches of his O'Connell line and the like, and some of them had to cross the Shannon from, from Kerry to Clare in the mid 1600s because of the, the co social and cultural pressures of the time, uh, one Oliver Cromwell. And so, some of them got back into Kerry again, so they went across the river and they came back again. Some of them managed to hang in all the while. So. You know, it's actually trying to relate the particular branches to historical events mm -hmm. and the like. And the, the more people that test, the tighter we can get for the mutation of specific SNPs. And we can actually offer them up against the, 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 his, you know, the, the history. Um, John, is there any chance of uh, identifying the great Donald Cam O'Sullivan Bear? Uh, or his descendant to us? The current holder, right? Right. And they changed religion, I think, it's about St. Now. Okay. Uh, uh, residing in London. Right. That would be a great project. I'd be very interested in that. Secondly, from Lara's talk on Friday, yes. we found that, uh, if, I rem if I remember correctly, the F13 um, was the majority in Ireland, yeah. the Bronze Age, and by the Iron Age, it was absolutely dominant. Yes. So you could probably expect that CTS. 4466 was already uh, located here and didn't come in from somewhere else. Okay, possibly, okay, possibly, okay, yeah. Right? And then uh, finally, <laughs> any comments on Brazil, the Kinnell Brazil Brack, which they've been identified as the F45, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, I don't know. I can't answer your first question. Mm. Well, second question, I suppose. One of the things that uh, this is a sort of a parallel study to this is that uh, I've been trying to sort of find the haplotype of different Brazil lines across Ireland and then that will potentially inform what results I might get from elsewhere. Part of the difficulty is it's a, it's a multi-genetic name in Ireland. It's also a name that's found quite extensively in Britain. And like now the extent to which British Brazils might be have an Irish origin is hard to know. It's hard to know. So well, we have to try and test those. Uh, talking about Lara's presentation is that as far as I know, that the sorts of the Brazils that you find in North Kerry and one with most distant uh, known ancestor in uh, West Clare they appear to have a Neolithic Y haplotype. So they didn't all get wiped out. Some of, the, some of them are there. But as Lara had said as well, they're hanging on in the far west. <laughs> um, you mentioned a few times, John, about uh, firming up the dating of yes. these various branching points. Yes. How do you see that's going to happen in the future? Because we have the big Y500 now. Uh, do you think it's going to be mainly a SNP-based um, uh, algorithm that we'd be using or is it going to involve STORs including 500 STORs or will it involve extensive genealogies or a combination of all three? Oh, I think the, the, the sorts of the big why the NGS testing is going to remain the gold standard for some time to come because it can obviously identify uh, a whole variety of uh, shared and unshared variants and the like. Now, I think there's a little bit more science into sort of trying to determine the clocks from the, 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 the sort of the, the unshared variants 
and like and the number of those that might or have been identified i think it was spoken during an earlier presentation during the meeting that these snip changes occur maybe every 100 or 144 years and the like and that if you can find sort of gradate you know the in the, you know the the the, the big points that I'm talking when we're talking about A451 or CTS4466 or A151 coming down to 714 and 715, these are just highlighted SNPs and the like. But there are other SNPs that are, have been identified betwixt and between. And you're, then as you come forward to historic times, you're talking about SNPs that have not yet been identified. So I think that does underscore the thing, the reason for continued uh, big Y. Or NGS testing. I think that's it. We need more people doing the big Y five hundred, really, don't yeah. we? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, listen, fantastic project and great work, John. Thank okay. you to you and the entire team, ladies and gentlemen, John Basil.